to a little town in Arizona called Globe. This is Globe today. Um, back in 1982, though, it was hardly more than a trailer park, a church, uh, a post office, and a copper mine. My dad was a miner, and in 1982, that mine closed. And because that was the only employer in that area, Globe became a ghost town for the next 15 years. My dad never graduated from high school, never got the GED, and no one in my family had ever gone to college. I'm still the only one who's had a college degree. Um, because of this, my dad really struggled to provide for us. We ate things like rattlesnakes and wild jackrabbits and prickly pears. But in spite of this, my brother and I were lucky enough to, to have, to be able to attend the local Catholic school, just out of the sisters' good graces. And this gift of free private education influenced me profoundly. It lit something in me. Those nuns were the most educated people I knew, and I wanted to be just like them. Well, kind of like them. <laughs> But I was so grateful for what they did for me that I still feel today. Um, I want to show a picture. Uh, oh, this is Holy Angels, where I went to, to school there. It's still standing there. I'm having trouble. Here we go. This right here is my brother and me. We were pretty inseparable as kids, which is kind of remarkable, because not only were we five years apart in age, um, we also had very different interests. My brother was very much a science person. He was the kind of kid who spent the summers reading math textbooks for fun, and learning computer languages. I was passionate about human languages, about history, about art. But in spite of our differences, my brother and I had two common languages. The first one was music, and the second was really having issues with. was Star Trek. <laughs> we didn't watch a lot of TV as kids, but we faithfully watched reruns of Star Trek over and over and over. What drew us to Star Trek? For my brother, it was science. For me, it was a vision that it offered of humanity that was very inspiring. So in the Star Trek universe in the 23rd century, humans have eradicated poverty. There's no need for money. There is no money. We can replicate food. So that frees humans up to follow their curiosity and their passions. We've become, instead of conquerors, we've become explorers and diplomats. Uh, about a, a little over a year ago, Leonard Nimoy passed. Way. And you may know that Nimoy played the most recognizable character on Star Trek, the Vulcan Spock. And Vulcans prize logic above all else, and there's no greater disgrace in Vulcan society than to show emotion. I often thought my brother was a lot like Spock. <laughs> but the really interesting thing about Spock's character is that he has a human mother. And so a lot of the show navigates his, his, uh, his shame at this part of himself. He was, he was raised in Vulcan society and emotions bad. And so he tries to keep these emotions under wrap while working among very emotional human beings. Um, however, as Spock's character develops over the years, his logic becomes very tempered by wisdom, by grace, even a sense of humanity. Looking back, Star Trek and really Spock represents for me a fusion of the best things in me and the best things in my brother. A fusion of science and humanity, or the humanities, as we talk about in the educational world. I want to talk tonight about education and specifically how education can shape the future of a community. And to look forward, we need to look back. So what is a 
21st century education look like, but we have to know how Western education has evolved. And when I use the word Western, I'm doing it very specifically. I'm, in, I'm intentionally excluding indigenous perspectives because First Nations people have always known that you can't divorce science or the hard rules of the universe from the art that shapes human perceptions of that universe. So they already know this. They don't even need to be here tonight. <laughs> but European formal education has been founded for hundreds of years on the idea of a liberal arts education. And that is an education that offers students a broad perspective, exposure to a variety of disciplines across the arts and the humanities, the arts and the sciences and then allows you to dive deeply into at least one area, what we call our major now. This idea started to be rethought along about World War II, when factory production was at its highest. Um, the war ended. Finally, the Great Depression was done. Jobs were fairly plentiful. But then we moved into the Cold War, nuclear arms race, Race. And if you were alive at that time, like I was, you remember that oppressive spirit, right? We were terrified of the Russians, <laughs> which seems ludicrous to me now. We were terrified. And if you're worried that the Russians are going to wipe you off the face of the planet, you don't have time to read Shakespeare or to ponder on the nature of beauty. This puts such pressure on us pr to produce better technology faster faster than the Russians, faster than the Chinese, faster than everyone. And we still see today this high premium that this military and economic competition placed for science and technology. We still live in that. And even though we've seen huge breakthroughs over the last century in science, we've also seen massive cuts in the arts and the humanities. And that's across the nation, across all grade levels. So my question, the question that we're wrestling with in the education community, and I hope we wrestle with tonight, is, is this mode of education, this model, obsolete? Have we moved past it? Is it still necessary for our budding STEM majors or scientists to take our classes, history, literature, those humanities, is it even necessary? My argument is that we need the humanities now more than ever because unprecedented advancements in science come with unprecedented complications. And we need to think critically, creatively, and compassionately about the implications of our work and our actions <clears throat> and even the guiding philosophies behind them. Because here's the thing, the technology that we produce lives in the human world, in the living world, and we have to deal with that. Here in the Yakima Valley, and especially in the Lower Valley, where I live and work, we face major social and environmental justice issues. We need well-educated leaders who have strong and diverse voices, who are able to think in creative ways, in diverse ways. And I'm not saying that these leaders are not going to be STEM leaders. On the contrary, I have deep faith in the STEM disciplines to lead us to innovation. But I also believe that, like Spock, those STEM leaders need to be tempered with the understanding of what it means to be human and what it means to live in community with other humans and other forms of life. We're going to need people from all disciplines, all walks of life, all kinds of work. <clears throat> to look at this specific place, the Yakima Valley, in this specific moment and ask, how did we get here? Why do we lack resources in this valley? Why are our infants dying at shocking rates? And what are the systemic, systemic injustices that lie behind those reasons? Why is our community so fragile, so precarious? And what are the things we can do to heal that community that will be transformative and lasting? 
This is what the study of humanities does. It produces creative problem solvers. It creates communicators. It teaches us to pull on the easy questions so that we get to those harder, deeper, more important questions. It also insists that we examine our own role in systems of injustice. Now this artificial barrier between STEM and the humanities is actually a very recent invention. It didn't exist for visionaries like da Vinci, who among other things, he was both an artist and a scientist, right? Da Vinci was a polymath. And polymaths are <laughs> so sorry. Polymaths are people who can draw on a wide range of expertise in many disciplines. Um, and we need, we need more polymaths. Medical schools in the past few years have been playing with the idea, don't get too panicked here, playing with the idea of opening their doors to English majors and philosophy majors in the hopes that bringing in students who think in fundamentally different ways can change the way we approach healthcare, the way we look at birth and death and all of those human milestones in between. Tech companies in particular are hiring more and more humanities majors. Steve Jobs famously said that it's in Apple's DNA, that technology is not enough, that it's technology married with the liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. Isn't that beautiful? I believe that we're on the cusp of a cultural shift, where we move away from the narrowly focused education of the past 70 years. Already, at least at the university level, we're moving from memorization and test taking to problem-based learning, which emphasizes learning through the act of solving real-world problems. So students will start a semester choosing an issue or a question in their community and then learning what kinds of knowledge they'll need to understand that issue, to solve that issue, and then communicate about it. That takes a da Vinci. We have to drop the fences between dis disciplines. We have to become cosmopolitan in the world of knowledge. As Adam mentioned, I teach at Heritage University, and um, one of my favorite classes is my Comparative World Lit class. I have a couple of students here tonight. No extra credit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I love this class because I, every semester, see a huge variety of students from all disciplines. It's a required course, so I, I see math people and science people and social workers have a lot of educators this semester. Um, and I always ask my students that no matter whatever text we're reading, that they relate that to something that's real in this, in this world, in this time. And I want to tell you a couple of examples of things that are happening in my classroom. My first example is an environmental science student. At the beginning of the semester, well, mid-semester, I usually have my students read letters written by European colonizers like Christopher Columbus. Most of my students have never read these letters before, and typically they're shocked by the brutality of the language, but even more than that, the brutality of the ideology behind it. So this science student was able to link Columbus's letters and his obsession with resource extraction at the expense of life to modern global and agricultural trends that are dismantling biodiversity and really devastating farmers, especially in, in impoverished nations. And the student is linking her research, her broader research, into a specific Mexican community where her family's from, and looking at why they no longer practice indigenous farming practices, and what impact this loss of traditional knowledge is going to have in agriculture. So the scope of her, her research has widened through encountering Christopher Columbus on the page. My second example, I want to talk about a social work student who read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass and was very interested in why American slaveholders had this practice of breaking 
enslaved families apart. So infants would be taken from mothers, husbands from wives, sent all across the state, the country. Why did this happen? And we talk about the ways we're weakened by being fractured from our families and our communities. And inevitably, our conversation came around to our tribal communities and, and the loss of traditional language and culture. And the student followed this trail to the Dawes Act of 1887, also called the General Allotment Act, in which the U.S.'s express explicit purpose was to break tribal bonds so that First Nations could be more easily assimilated as individuals, not as a group. Now she's building research into the current failings of our foster system and how those failings reflect racist practices and racist perspectives of the past. Pretty revolutionary. I want to end today by circling back to Star Trek. You know I was going there again. And to a little girl who was surviving on rattlesnake meat and government-issued peanut butter in the desert of Arizona. Star Trek for me offered the possibility of a future of not only unimaginable scientific breakthroughs, but breakthroughs in the art of being human. I'm reminded of a poem by Walt Whitman written in 1885, excuse me. When I heard the learned astronomer when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I was sitting in the lecture room, sorry, when I was I sitting heard this, the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. My wish for you is that in your quest for education, to educate yourself, to educate others, in that quest for a paycheck, and I know how important that paycheck is, that you take time to look up from your microscopes, look up from your computers, look up from your smartphones, to take time as Van Gogh did and so many others to look into the starry night. I hope you take time to feel small against the backdrop of the universe and then to feel large in connection with others. I hope that you'll join me in advocating for this vision of education that will take us into a great future. Thank you.